the Seattle general strike begins with World War I, right? Younger folks had to flock to places like Seattle to help them build ships and armaments. Right. Yeah, the federal government had actually frozen wages to help the war effort, but they promised these workers that they would get a raise after the war. And when those raises never showed up, the unions wanted to negotiate and the managers totally ignored them. 35,000 shipyard workers went on strike immediately. And immediately yeah. after that, the rest of the city joined in on that strike in solidarity. Now, while the unions and the members of the IWW were organizing this general strike, the city's newspapers, which all had ties to uh, you know, big rich people, were printing stories nice. about how the strikes are un-American. Yeah, but these socialists, the socialists that we know, uh, had papers of their own. Uh, and a woman named Anna Louise Strong penned an op-ed uh, that kind of set the world on fire. <laughs> We are undertaking the most tremendous move ever made by labor in this country. A move which will lead no one knows where. Labor will feed the people. Labor will care for the babies and the sick. Labor will preserve order. She changed it into a drama. Us versus them. The workers versus the capitalist. Which, this is like the first like viral thing that happened. Uh, you know, they, it, it might be the, uh, the first time that a hashtag was ever invented. Uh, it was on a picket sign. Uh, but that joke didn't land. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, now, these organizers had set the strike to ensure that no one would show up to work in, February, in early February of 1919. The Democratic mayor of Seattle, a guy by the name of Ollie Hansen, grew more and more paranoid and fearful. So he decided that he's going to deputize a bunch of citizens and a bunch of college kids. He saw an opportunity to play on the public's fears of a workers' revolution. Ollie Hansen was an opportunist of the first order. He inflated this for all it was worth and saw personal advantage probably right from the start. It was to Hansen's best interest to make the strike as radical as it could be perceived. Hansen warned citizens that a dangerous revolution was at hand. He deputized and armed hundreds of private citizens, including many young students from the University of Washington. He sent them into the streets to enforce order. Now, if you ever needed proof that the rich and powerful use, were using the working class as cannon fodder, it's in the constant use of children as a deputized police force to stop the advancement of human rights. You know? So he also called in the National Guard, right? He set up machine guns and had army trucks all around the city. Guys, this strike hadn't even started yet. Could you imagine if this was happening today, right? Like the strike hasn't started, there's military people all over the streets. I bet you that the mainstream media would come out and claim that these army trucks were driven by Antifa and that the anarchists <laughs> had co-opted these trucks. <laughs> they're out there Absolutely. trying, you know, they're out there trying to incite violence, right? I, actually, right here, this is a picture of the of the Antifa headquarters, right? If you got you got to squint, and you got to kind of punch yourself in the eye, and then the <laughs> the head trauma that you caused yourself will show you where Antifa is. So <laughs> it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> we found them, you guys. Here's the, here's the truth of what happened, right? Not one striker was violent when the day came. Right. For the general strike, 65,000 workers just didn't show up to work. The city yeah. was totally silent. Yeah. And then rumors started spreading around that Ollie Hansen had been murdered. <gasps> Nothing moved but the tide. The eerie silence bred rumors that the mayor had been assassinated and buildings blown up. But here, by guess, 
is that all of this rumor uh, was started by Ole Hansen, right, to try to blame it on the strikers. That would be my guess in this situation. But here's the thing. People started getting restless. Well, once the rumor mill starts going around, people start getting restless. So the organizers of the, of the strike itself tapped into their ranks, and they had unarmed veterans maintain order. Fearing that the city could descend into chaos, labor organized a group of unarmed war veterans to help police the strikers. They patrolled the city, breaking up crowds and urging strikers to keep the peace. The labor movement had planned very carefully for the strike, and their number one object and concern was, we cannot have any violence, we cannot have any sense of disorder. And they were completely successful at this. The organizers also set up kitchens in various parts of town. Uh, they fed families. They were delivering milk to homes, oil to hospitals. They collected trash, and for the five days that this strike went on, some of the guardsmen that were stationed in Seattle itself said that they had never seen a city run with more order and peace. Which is almost like, like if you give people their basic needs and actually like take care of them, there's like no reason for citizens to you know like steal and and hurt each other. You know, it's it's crazy. In five, in five days, in one city, we were able to go from capitalist primates slinging poo at each other, <laughs> you know, for cash, into a more evolved species that was doing its part to make our community vibrant and far more meaningful. It was amazing. So when Ole Hansen couldn't get these strikers to be violent, he just started arresting people. He started arresting all of the strike organizers um, and then blocking um, the, the workers from getting any of the resources that they needed. And then he started threatening martial law on people. And eventually, because the organizers were arrested, there was threats of martial law, people were getting hungry and restless. Because of the lock, lack of morale, the strike ended. The general strike of 1919 is, has mixed results. Right? Because the shipping industry never came back to what it was, it never got back up to its glory. But it did scare the employers and created a different sense of what was possible. Now, Ole Hansen became a hero because America loves its paranoid strongmen who use fear as a <laughs> sense of morality. <laughs> we love it. Yeah, Nixon, Trump, we love it. It's a big, it's a big deal. <laughs> Now, the, the bosses feared what the general strike had actually proven. As Dana Frank, the labor history professor at the University of California in Santa Cruz, points out, it, di it, just, it didn't just show union power to employers, but it showed that working people could run the city themselves. It asks the question out of all of us, do we need Congress or politicians or legislators if we, the people, can provide what we need ourselves. The Seattle General Strike of 1919 is proof that working people had power in kind of an indirect way. Now, following this strike, Seattle's most wealthy and largest employers founded the American, or I'm sorry, the, the Associated Industries of Seattle, which was a conglomerate of bosses from the waterfront from the metalworks and from building companies, right? Their main goal was to, was to make sure that unions were squashed. Basically what they had created was like an anti-union union is what they created. They created an anti-union union, right? They're like the Thanos of labor, you guys, you know? What they wanna do is wipe out one half of life and then try to profit off of the other half. That's what they want to do. And what they claimed, they tried to use this class consciousness uh, to, to their advantage, right? They came out and claimed that they were fighting against working class tyranny. Guys, we really have to stop oppressing the rich, okay? We really get... We got to stop. I mean, we're out there, you know, fucking marching, 
saying things like, we want human rights. But, but have any of us really stopped and thought about a rich person's super yacht? Well, I mean, where are these yachts people? Yachts are people too. Yeah, yachts are people too, you guys. Yachts are people too. Where are these, where are these trust fund kids going to pop champagne on the asses of hoes? <laughs> what are they, on regular yachts what is this russia this is america people okay <laughs> can't do not, it on a pontoon boat man you can't do it on a pontoon boat you guys okay that you can maybe shotgun a miller light that's allowed on a pontoon. <laughs> that's right <laughs> you can't go beyond the miller right guys how are we going to get these people more private helicopters with their own personal prostitutes if they have to pay a living wage have you guys thought about this Tom? i bet none of you fucking thought about this selfish is what that is now these uh these associated industries of seattle uh they also employed spies to try to bring the unions down from the inside there were personal papers uh, that were released by, uh, from, from two major employers that hired these spies to disrupt union action. What this involved is uh, cops being called on the IWW headquarters, and they would come in and they, they would try to break up any sort of demonstration that was going on, right? Basically, this was like America's version of James Bond, uh, which, just, which just turned out to be like the Uncle Tom of labor. That's essentially what it turned out to be, right? Like, they just just trying to keep poor people poorer and suckling at the teats of power. That's really all they're doing. They also hired the Pinkertons and other detective agencies to follow members of the union around. And then they created their own unions and used that as a way to prohibit immigrants from being hired and then use that as a way to demonize unions even further. Right? These, these are the rich billionaires in our society that we like to fawn and glorify. Right, the racist xenophobes that want you to suffer for their wealth. That's who they really are. Now, as a major city in, in America was, you know, attacking its working class with spies and thugs and <laughs> military, Canada was in the midst of its own general strike. In 1919, uh, Canada was also suffering through a post-war recession uh, pay was down, and the cost of living was going up. You know, kind of like how a logical economy is supposed to run. <laughs> you know, you, mm. you just got to pay people less and then skyrocket the price of everything else. Just like, just like how the logic works. Now, <laughs> Canadian workers were having a problem with union recognition. A lot of these bosses were not recognizing the union, so they were talking about a one big union, similar to what the international workers of the world were. Uh, when managers didn't want to negotiate with metal and trade unions, they called for a strike. So in May of 1919, 30,000 workers from the police, the fire department, garment workers, utility, all walked off the job. They all yeah, walked off the job, yeah, in, in solidarity with their working class brothers and sisters. Now, a citizen committee of 1,000 people was formed to stop that strike. So... That's a thousand nays to thirty thousand yays. That's a little bit of a difference, <laughs> you know. I'm not I'm not a math genius, but uh, I'm 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 seeing the scales being tipped in one direction, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that the government ignores so many voices is kind of proof that democracy isn't real, right? Now, the, the Citizen Committee of, uh, of a thousand people pretty much used uh, xenophobia and racism as, and fear as much as they could, right? They got, they got papers to print that these strikers were alien scum, alien scum, you guys. And the government si sided with the vocal minority, and they threatened to fire a lot of these federal employees and then deport British immigrants, which I think is the first time that I think any British person has ever heard that they're going to be deported out of a country. <laughs> right? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that normally doesn't happen. <laughs> but this is kind of like the classic defense that abusive partners use, isn't it? Right? They're just like, you, you, want, to, you want to see crazy? Oh, I'll show you crazy. <laughs> 
you know, and then they like bite the head off of a bat, you know? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and then you're like, where'd you get that bat from? Have you, <laughs> have you just had this bat on you the whole time? How did I not see this bat? <laughs> what is happening right now? That was the Canadian government, you guys. <laughs> That's what the Canadian government was. So on, uh, on June 17th, 10 of the strike leaders were arrested, right? Similar to what happened in Seattle. Ten, 10 of these strike leaders were arrested. But on June 21st, the rank and file organized a peaceful march, which was met, obviously, uh, with police brutality from the mounted police. Which, the mounted police are just like fancy horse cops. That's really all they are. They were just <laughs> fancy horse cops. Now, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> it kind of just sounded like they were going to joust some protesters, but it was like way worse than that, you guys. Uh, what happened was that the cops fired shots, the crowd turned violent, they overturned a streetcar, you know, two strikers were killed, and 30 were injured. This incident is famously known as Bloody Saturday in Canada. Uh, yeah, and uh, Bono did not write a song about this. He did not write a song about this at all. I mean, you could have done a twofer, you know? You could have done Bloody Sunday, and then you could have done Bloody Saturday. It's like a part one, part two kind of thing. Bono, you fucking missed out, Bono. You missed <laughs> out. Now, the Canadian government did set up a memorial for the streetcar instead of the people. They did do that, so that was nice. They built a statue of a streetcar. That is a joke. Uh, I feel like. Oh, okay. guys... <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote that, I was mildly concerned oh, that I'm people sorry. were going to take it too fucking seriously. Uh, <laughs> I did. <Totally>. Yeah. <laughs> because I think one of the worst things that's happened in 2020 oh. is that satire has just been bitch slapped in the face. <laughs> 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 I wrote that I was like they're gonna get it they're pretty smart they're gonna get into but you guys were just like holy fuck did they really build a statue for a streetcar that's crazy what the fuck <laughs> oh I'm gonna get sued by Canada it's fine uh, <laughs> so uh, seven out of ten of the strike leaders were charged with conspiracy to topple the government and uh, the other three were released. And when they were released, they called an end to the strike because they didn't want to see any more bloodshed, right? These strike leaders uh, eventually, by the late 1920s, wound up in the Canadian government, which eventually led to Canadian workers receiving collective bargaining rights 30 years after the general strike. So by 1950, they received uh, collective bargaining uh, rights in Canada. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, if you like the content that we're putting up on this channel, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe to this channel. All three of those things help this channel grow, help uh, other people see this channel and discover this channel. Um, platforms like YouTube and Facebook and uh, you know, other, uh, other platforms don't particularly like to show content like this, show um, engaging content that talks about history and the truth and what's actually going on with our system and, at, at hand. So uh, I depend on you guys, the viewers, that if you guys like it, to make sure that you hit the like and then make sure that you share it with uh, whoever you think is going to enjoy uh, content like this, whether it's a friend or a family member or an enemy, whoever it is, uh, you guys could share that with. That would be awesome. And make sure that you're subscribed. Um, I, there, there's the more people that subscribe to this channel, again, the more that it'll be shown to other people and the more updates you'll get from my channel. I release videos uh, pretty consistently, uh, at least uh, a few times a week. Um, I do a live stream uh, via my Facebook page uh, uh, two or three times a week as well, where you get to talk to me and interact with me while we go over some you know, news stories that might have fallen through the cracks or mainstream media just doesn't touch at all. So. Uh, yeah, I hope you guys do that. Uh, the other way that you can help support this show is uh, by making a financial contribution. If that is, uh, if that is possible for you to do, uh, it, is, it is not a necessity. Uh, all of my content is going to be available for free. Very little goes behind a paywall. But if you do become a sustaining member 
via my website, uh, via Patreon, or via Bandcamp. It does give you unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content that nobody else gets. That's a little perk. That's a little thing behind the paywall. Uh, you get early uh, access to full episodes of Forkful of Noodles. Like these are these are segments of a much larger piece. You get the larger piece before anybody else does. You get early access to that. Uh, you get uh, free tickets to the live virtual stand-up comedy shows where these clips are from, um, and uh, and a bunch of other stuff. There's going to be some merch coming up. Um, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be releasing some new merch as well. So uh, keep your eyes uh, out peeled for that, and that'll be avail- All will be available on my website at krishmohan.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N.com. Uh, I also have a new stand-up comedy album, and um, that is available on all of the platforms you get your comedy stuff from. And uh, one of the things I'm doing with these virtual stand-up comedy shows and the uh, merch sales, whether it's like the t-shirt stuff or if it's the album, is I am going to be donating half of the um, half of the sales to a grassroots organization. Uh, you know, like a mutual aid or a particular a grassroots venue that I've worked with um, or, you know, uh, an independent journalist or uh, something along those lines, something grassroots, so people that are bringing you the truth and bringing you the information, people that I use as sources for, for, for my comedy and for these pieces as well. So, uh, you know, by, by contributing and, and buying tickets or, or buying merchandise or buying those albums, uh, you, you're, you're contributing to also help um, a grassroots organization grow. Uh, so that is, uh, that's a cool little perk that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do my part uh, during, during this crazy age that we're all living in. So uh, I hope you consider going through the links, uh, checking out what you want to uh, be a part of, checking out what you can donate to, um, and, uh, and help, uh, help, help this channel grow, uh, help me put food on the table, earn a living, all that sort of stuff, um, and help the, some, a, a grassroots organization um, grow and, uh, you know, find their path and what they're doing, uh, to, to make this place a better world for everybody. So, um, stay tuned. There's a lot more content coming up on this channel. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for, uh, being a subscriber or, or considering becoming a subscriber for this, this channel. Uh, until the next video, uh, see you on the road.